All right, friends. This is the third part of a three-part series that should have been a two-part series, according to what I said the other day. And it arguably could have been no series at all and just one long video. But what's the fun in that? So this is the introduction to this channel. So again, in the first video, I went over the channel, a little bit about me. In the second video, I showed you guys where I spend the majority of my time. And in this video, we're just going to go over the basics of the tools that I use. The most raw basics. I can't stress that enough. This is not going to be exhaustive, clearly. This is not going to be comprehensive at all. The purpose of this video is to show anybody who might already follow me on Twitter might have already seen some of my videos on this channel or block roots and who still looks at a tpo chart or a footprint chart uh and asks me what the hell am i looking at you know is this some kind of video game is this tetris uh, the purpose of this video is to just really demystify those two things because they are extremely simple uh, extremely simple tools and after this video you you'll, you should definitely understand that it should be as clear as day uh, a footprint chart is the most raw look at the market uh, and a TPO chart market profile and while you could get into like auction market theory and you know a, a bunch of different things with that um, all it is is a tool that just shows you the distribution of prices so the purpose of this video is to really just clear those two things up, give you a little bit of the anatomy of each, and that's really it. There'll be obviously a, a lot of follow-up on these tools um, in videos that I continue to put out. But the purpose of this video, so again, if, if you're tuning in and you understand these two things, you probably can just save some time and, and ditch this video because I'm going to be really basic. I, I can't stress that enough. Um, the most rudimentary of... Uh, approaches to these two things so before we get into actually looking at the individual tools themselves um, and a tpo chart just means a time price opportunity chart it's uh, otherwise referred to as market profile there's two questions right where does the market i mean there's more than two questions when it comes to the market i'm pretty sure you guys know that by now um, but where does the market like to do business so where is the market establishing value? Where is the market spending the most amount of time? And the inverse to that, where does it not like to spend time? What regions of price or what regions of the chart does price not like to spend time in? Where does it favor? Um, and then how much business is being done? So how much is actually being transacted at those levels? How much risk is being put on between buyers and sellers? how much is actually being committed to certain price points. So the footprint chart and a TPO chart can do a hell of a job at answering these two questions. Now, obviously, these are not the only two questions that you're going to want to answer. This is not the end-all, be-all for trading. It's not like, okay, as soon as I'm done watching you know, this video, or rather not this video, but understanding these two questions and you know, the ins and out of... Uh, you know, where value is being established, where it's rejecting, you know, uh, how much positioning is coming into the market. That's it. That's like the skeleton key for the market. That's not the case. These are just like, you know, two parts of a, a, a multi-pronged, um, you know, multi-headed dragon, really. That's what the market is. But ideally, from this video, you'll have a, a little bit of an idea of how these two things help you establish that. And if anything, at least you'll be able to look at a market profile chart or TPO chart uh, and look at a footprint chart and know what the, you know, know what the hell you're looking at, right? And that's really, that's the point of this video. The point of this video is going to be just geared to really noobs. Um, <laughs> I don't remember the last time I used that word. Maybe it was when I played like Counter-Strike, but, uh, that's just the purpose of this video. So if you're watching this, you follow me on Twitter, right? Kenner and Clark, and you look at the stuff that I share when I do share charts that are, you know, not your standard candlestick chart. Um, moving forward, you're going to be able to know exactly what the hell you're looking at. All right, so let's get into it. All right, so let's get started. 
I'm kind of excited because I'm actually not looking at my PC right now. I'm through my PC, but I'm drawing on my iPad with my pencil and it's wirelessly connected to my PC. So I could write out nice and smoothly with this pencil. I can move things around. It's actually, uh, it's really nice and I plan on using this for more videos, but I know you guys probably don't give a shit. It's actually not that exciting. Anyway, this is the footprint chart. So we're gonna go over this first. Uh, this in particular over here is the footprint chart. So this is a footprint chart, okay? This all is a DOM or a ladder, okay? DOM equals a depth of market, okay? So these two are related. You're not really gonna, not everyone really has to worry about uh, this guy over here because not everyone really has access to the software or uses the software rather to actually execute through one of these. If you're a legacy trader, if you've traded legacy index futures, um, if you've traded commodities, chances are you are probably more familiar with what's on the left or what something that looks like uh, what is on the left um, then if you're primarily, you know, had started in uh, the crypto market where most of the trading is on the exchange, right, is on the web platform, which is not ideal. So ideally, um, it's not ideal. So ideally, followed up right away, a little redundant. Um, ideally, though, over time, there's more of these platforms on the left. There's more of this software, more integrations uh, and more options, really. That's it's really all you want. You want options. Like if you're trading legacy, you know, you could trade through um, trading technologies if you want to fork over a thousand dollars a month. Uh, they have a great ladder. You could trade through Jigsaw. They have great software. Or you could use Sierra Charts. Um, there are plenty of options. Whereas crypto, it's only becoming more popular recently. But for the sake of this video, we're not really concerned with this up here. I'm just going to be talking about how these, this and all of this relate. Now this is just my speed order entry. That's just for putting in order amounts very quickly. You know, if I'm trading BTC, you could see it has, you know, add five BTC, add 10 BTC, add 25. I could, you know, zero it out or exit out. Um, and I quickly have an idea of like what kind of size that I'm trading and, you know, how many I want to add, how many I want to take off, you know, my initial leg in for a trade depending on how much risk I'm taking, what that's going to look like, how I'm going to scale out. This just makes that, um, this just makes that a lot more uh, available and, and a lot more, um, it makes me rather more effective at, uh, at trading <clears throat> and, and inputting those. So, you know, to pain in the ass, if you had to type that in every time or if you had to change that, you know, again, by clicking, typing, and doing all that. If you're a point-and-click trader, if you're a discretionary trader, all that shit adds up. Right? You want to have as seamless and frictionless a process as possible if you're trading more high, you know, mid to higher frequencies. So real quick, though, on the DOM, depth of market, you've probably seen a depth of market before. If you've seen something that looks like, you know, for example, you might have like, here's your best, uh, that's bed. Here's your, uh, let's say, best bid, best offer or ask. A lot of times you'll hear ask, and then you have something that looks kind of like this, right? Here's a current price, and here's your depth of market. All of this is, you know, it could be stacked like that, where it's cumulative, so like it's, you know, adding everything up under and over it, or you might have it so it's at each level. So you might have like volume here, an order here, another order there, you know, here's current price, and then, you know, let's say the bid is like really stacked. Okay, the regardless that these are that's limit orders, right? That's this is your bid, this is your offer or your ask, and those are providers, right? They're providing liquidity. Um, they're offering liquidity, right? It's a limit order, so it's not. It's the opposite of a of a, you know a market order where you're taking liquidity. You know, limit order. You're not guaranteed to get hit. You're not guaranteed to get filled. None of that. Whereas a market order, you're taking from either of those sides, but the this right here is related to that this right here is related to that okay so that's the reason why i want to point out the dom you know and go over that first 
if I'm placing a limit order and I'm placing an order to either buy to open up a position or buy to close out a short or cover a short, if I'm placing a limit order, it's going to show up here. If I'm doing the opposite, if I'm placing an order to close out a long, right, or open up a short and it's a limit order, I'm going to be placing it up here. And, and again, this is going to be a really, a really basic video. Sorry, I don't know why I circled that again because I wasn't referring to that again. Um, this is going to be a really basic video, but uh, if there's already an order, let's say at 20,055 and I place a limit buy there, uh, whoever is ahead of me has priority in the queue. So it's not necessarily that uh, you know I'm going to get filled. We could transact into that level, fill up that 77 BTC buy order, whether, again, that's to close a short or to open up a position, open up new business. And if no more is transacted at that level, right, then I'm kind of left shit out of luck, right? If I'm not first in the line or close to the front, um, you know, there's no guarantee that I'm necessarily going to get hit if there's no more order or if there's no more flow behind that actual order. But let's talk about the footprint. Okay. The benefit of just really quickly though, so for anyone who's interested, the benefit of using this chart, if I, let's say there's a couple of options that I have. So if I'm going to be using these buttons, those are market orders. Okay. That is going to be when I'm taking liquidity. So if I market buy, so if I hit this green button, I'm taking from there. I'm taking from the available liquidity. If I buy 100 BTC and there's, you know, not 100 BTC on the best offer and not even 100 BTC until we get all the way up here, I'm slipping all that, right? I'm buying through that entire stack. If I mark it by, my order shows up on the right side of the footprint. So here's your market buy side and market sell side on the other side of that. Okay, so the footprint looks like that. Everything on the left, market sells. Everything on the right, market buys. So if I hit market sell, I am taking from the bid. Again, it, if, if there's not an adequate amount of the size that I'm looking to take, then I'm going to have to go across multiple prices. And that's when slip is going to come. That's when, you know, obviously transaction costs will begin to add up depending on how much available liquidity there is and how much I'm looking to transact. Anyway, so that's if I use a market order. I'm taking liquidity, all right? I'm guaranteeing a fill, but I'm taking liquidity. So again, just to reiterate, on the left side, all of this, if I'm selling, that shows up here, right? And I'm not talking about just this individual footprint. I'm talking about the left side of the footprint. So market sell, market buy, I'll leave that right there. And the opposite, if I market buy, it is showing up on the other side of the footprint. If I market buy, I'm taking from taking from this side, right? And it's showing up on the other side of the footprint, right? So you have a couple other options on, you know, this platform. I could place a bet, I could place a bid immediately. So if I use, you know, this, or if I use this, I can either, you know, in this case, place a bid immediately. If I use this button, I could buy just the size I'm looking to right off the ask if that size is available. We're not really gonna get into that because again, not everyone uses the software anyway. Um, so specifically getting into the footprint. So this is something that uh, obviously more people are going to be interested in because not everyone's going to use that platform. So on the left-hand side, like I said, so let's just break this down in the most simple terms. We are looking at the raw, so a footprint. Let's get that pencil working. Jeez. Footprint. Raw aggressive buying and selling okay so it's the most raw look at the market and i say raw because we're down to the core right this is the most granular look you could get granular right if you go down into much smaller tick sizes but this is the most granular sort of atomized look at the market right we're breaking it down if we look at if i have you know if i'm looking at a structure and I have a candlestick like this. Let's say it has a big wick. I don't know if that, or let's draw one that's similar to a footprint that's on this chart. Let's draw, so this candle right here, let's draw that just in candlestick form, right? So there's really no shadow at the bottom. You got a big wick though. A candlestick is four data points. I don't know anything about what took place in that, right? Now imagine, that that's the swing failure from above a previous high. I don't really know anything that took place above there. 
I don't know if on that alone, like I know that your know, price traversed the level, right? I know that price has, you know, created a swing point, spent time away from it, came back to it, taken it. But I don't know if there's actually a lot of traders trapped above there. I don't know if new longs opened up. Um, I don't know if shorts were closed out. I don't know where exactly most of that business was done. There could be no business up there, right? There could have been no stops up there whatsoever. It was just thin. Price just skipped through the level and that's it. There could have been a ton of longs that opened up through there, right? There could have been a lot of activity on there that on the candlestick alone, and I'm drawing that because if you're looking at a profile, it would show up like that. On the candlestick alone, just four data points, you don't get any of that, right? So a footprint chart gives us a look under the surface. Um, let me just get rid of, because my pictures are popping up on the bottom. Um, a footprint chart gives us a look under the surface, right? So right here, so we'll focus on this one. Right here, that is your agro cells into limit bids. So on the left side of the footprint chart, what is detailed in red, okay? And I have mine colored by Delta. So what that means is if there are more sellers than buyers at the particular price point in volume, there'll be a negative Delta, right? So I have it colored red to indicate that. On the left-hand side, those are aggressive sells that come into limit bids. So again, the limit bids though, don't have to be buyers to open up positions. We're not saying anything about that yet. So a limit bid can be, right? So a limit bid can be new business uh, and a new business would be what? That'd be opening a long. or old business. So old business would be closing a short. Damn, I really tucked myself into that little spot. So it doesn't have to be that there's a buyer in that limit bid, right? It could be a short closing, right? So it is a buyer, but it's not new business. That's what I meant to say. Um, so the left side, again, that is your aggressive sell orders into limit bids. The right side is the opposite, right? So the right side, the activity on the right-hand side of the structure, here, 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 no, here, here. Um, that is your aggressive buying, right? So market orders to buy. Now it doesn't have to be, so again, it's a market buy, buy, it looks like boy, into, a limit offer or ask that market buy doesn't have to be from a position to open so again the concept of new business versus old business that market buy can be either to open or to close a short. I look, this writing is like chicken scratch right now. I'll try to make sure that it's a more legible for future videos. So it doesn't have to tell us anything about direction. All we know is that that volume was transacted there. So the benefit of a footprint is you could actually see where a ton of business was done and you could begin to actually make an argument if you look at this and something like open interest, right? So for example, you know, it doesn't have to, I don't have to start saying whether or not it's aggressive buyers, or aggressive sellers, but you could have a case where, you know, let's say that this high was taken out and this is a swing failure. This would be a pretty attractive swing failure, right? If, especially if it was above this prior high, um, at the Pico high, because you actually have a good amount of volume coming in above that level. Now, if into that move, OI is ramping up, right? There's a little bit more case behind it, right? There's a little bit more, um, I guess, uh, evidence behind it actually being a little bit, uh, I'm, I'm using the term a little bit too much, being more substantial than if there was really no volume at all transacted. Because there's two sides of this. The amount of market buys that are coming in, and then the opposite of that is there's someone actually sitting there selling that, okay? There's more nuance to this as price moves up. There's a zero print right there, which means that as price continued up, the bid stayed below that level and there's only buying above there and, and that price level never went bid. That's, that's more nuance. There's no, I'm not going to get into that in this video, but at a, 
again, just a basic understanding of the footprint. All we're looking at is aggressive sell orders on the left into passive bids. Okay. And on the right hand side, aggressive buy orders into passive offers or passive asks. That doesn't say anything. Remember, you can have an aggressive sell come into the market to either open a short or close a long. And you can have an aggressive buy come into the market to either open a long or close a short. So, what this gives us an idea of, though, is how much volume and risk is actually being transacted at any given level. And you can begin to use this to build cases behind breakouts, failures, traps. Um, there's a particular setup called a mouse trap. You could begin to add weight to those setups when you have sort of a, you know, under the hood look at how much volume is actually being transacted at any particular level. You could see really thin moves. There might be a case where you have, let's say, you know, footprint chart, just draw something that looks like one. And within the structure, you know, maybe uh, you have a bunch of buy orders come in on the right hand side. And all of this is zero prints. And maybe what this was is as price came above a level, let's say this was an important level, there was a bunch of stops there for shorts and price blew through those stops. These are all the shorts closing on the right hand side right into those passive offers and the reason why this is all zero printed is because all that did was blow spreads out all that did was blow spreads out the bid never followed up there was actually no you know aggressive selling volume done in that level but all we did was stop out one side of the market so not to complicate this at all by going into anything else all we're looking at is the aggressive order flow and the opposite of the aggressive order flow is obviously in the limit bid or or in the offer depending on what side uh, or what direction we're talking about. So this gives you more of a look though than, again, just your basic candlestick chart. I'm obviously gonna go into this in a lot more detail in, in future live streams and anyone who's been following me for some time now probably doesn't need this video at all. Uh, it might not need me to even go into detail, but the point of this video is just to give anyone who has no idea what the fuck they're looking at some kind of insight. And there's a ton of nuance that takes place within this, right? You know, you might look at this on a 30 minute chart to get some kind of idea of where maybe certain pockets of support or resistance might be, you know, where you could look at, maybe you might look for certain anomalies. Um, you could have single prints within the structure, which we'll talk about further uh, when, when talking about market profile. You might look at this on a very low time frame. You might use this to corroborate some kind of, uh, you know, trading of the one minute chart and looking for, again, aggressive positioning either to get trapped through a certain level momentum to pick up or die down the footprint chart just gives you more insight okay but that that's all it is there's really you know there's not a whole lot to it what it does is just make things a bit more clear because again you might have a situation where even a candle like you know let's say it was uh what's that candle called like a hammer candle let's say it was something like this if you're looking at a candle like that versus a candle like this the one on the right looks a lot more substantial, right? The one on the left, the wick doesn't look like it's meaningful at all. But meanwhile, if you look at a footprint chart in that wick, you know, you might have had a ton of aggressive selling showing up on the left-hand side of it, right? And, you know, no offer following down. And you could begin to make a case for if this was, let's say, over a multi, you know, depending on what point in time or you know, chart you're looking at, let's say it's a long period of time and price swings through the level and this occurs through the level, well then that's much more, uh, that's a much stronger case for some kind of swing failure setup back in the opposite direction, especially if this, all of this aggressive selling again on the left-hand side, imagine it was that setup right there. Um, all of that selling came into the market and got trapped. I mean, this is not necessarily, I just took this screenshot, but it's almost, you know, you could look at basically this structure right here Imagine that these lows, you're looking at, you know, a long period of time, these lows are being defended. Price finally breaks through. You think, okay, so this should lead to continuation. Sellers come in and instead buyers reverse this. And now we have aggressive buyers taking us back in the opposite direction. So you had price bouncing off this level, acting as support, you know, finally gives way. There's no continuation. Instead, traps activity below there. You could actually see, hey, is this, are we talking like 500,000 contracts or let's say some big $10 million seller comes in, you could see if they got trapped and who got trapped under there and how much volume was transacted. You know, you might look at open interest doing something like this and then really picking up and then be able to say, okay, 
this is a significant trap setup. You can't say any of that with any certainty if you're looking at just a candlestick chart. So that's the footprint chart, very basic stuff. I didn't wanna take this any further than really just covering the anatomy of it. Within this footprint chart, you have, you're gonna have, you know, you might have gloss it up a little bit. You might uh, establish where the point of control is. That'd be the highest level, you know, volume level within the footprint chart. You know, very quickly you could find that by even just looking at how much volume was transacted from left to right. So for example, um, in this candle right here, I could see that the, you know, point of control was right here. All right, so from left to right, okay, there was 1.4 million contracts at the bid, you know, and that it's same price point, 574,000 contracts. And that, based on that tick setting, is the point of control for the structure, right? So that's where most of the volume was, tra you know, transacted in that structure. Now, if you're looking at candles and, and seeing that, you know, you're looking at momentum, a lot of times you're going to want to see that most of the volume is done towards the high. And I'm just drawing that structure to indicate that, you know, if you were looking at a footprint, you should see that they're kind of being aggressive towards the high still if you're looking at momentum moving upward. The opposite if you're looking at, you know, prices continuing to trend down. A couple other things as well, though, like I said, you know, one of them is delta. Um, so if we're looking at, you know, this structure and this is this is highlighted red and this is highlighted blue, you know, you don't necessarily need to, I have mine broken up, so it's not as useful, but if you were looking at a footprint chart and instead of breaking this down to the bid ask, you just created individual profiles, you might have a profile that let's say this one is blue, this one is red, you know, this one is red. And what that is doing is calculating the delta and then coloring that area based on whether or not for each individual level, you know, this would be red, let's say, because there were 100 contracts sold and only 50 bought. And this would be blue because let's say there was only 50 contracts sold and 100 bought. So, you know, this would be a positive 50, this would be a negative 50, um, and that's how you would establish delta. And this ties more into, we'll, you know, further in another video go over cumulative volume delta uh, and delta in more detail. Um, but if you're using platforms and using footprint chart and you have the option to, you know, color by delta, that's something that uh, a lot of people do. Another thing, I'm um, thinking if there's anything else that I'm missing, uh, not for this particular setup. I just wanted to, again, go over very basic parts. Uh, one more detail. We don't really ever look at a footprint chart. Um, that looks like a cross. We don't look at a footprint chart in terms of, okay, so there was 100 sold into the bid there. And then, you know, there was 50 bought into the ask here. And this is all, let's say, taking place at 20K. We don't look at it that way. We look at it as, I'm just gonna try to delete this, ah, I fucked it up. Um, we look at it like this. So let's say this line is 20K. At the 20K handle, we look at the volume this way. So there was 50K bought here, 100K bought there. At that handle, we say that sellers are more dominant than buyers, right? Rather than looking at you know, this 50K right next to that price point. Because if you start thinking about this like a DOM or like an order book, didn't mean to do that, that's how that's how that's occurring, right? So here's, let's say that that is, you know, 20K. Here are your asks. Here are your bids, right? If there's a seller there, they're hitting into the best bid. If there's a buyer, they're hitting into the best ask, and it's gonna show up like this, right? So you look at it at a as a sort of cross section, so on an angle, rather than looking at it purely from left to right. All right, so that is the footprint chart. Now let's take a look at the TPO chart. Okay, moving on to market profile. And again, just the basics. We're gonna go over essentially just the anatomy of this structure. Uh, I'll briefly touch on, you know, the the origin of this because I think it's uh, <clears throat> it's useful to know. This is a time, this was developed during, so this is a really old tool. It, that's all it is, first of all. It's a tool. It's not a strategy. It's not a, uh, it's not a system. It's a tool. All it does is it shows you the distribution of prices over a session. So we're looking at dailies. You might look at weeklies. Um, you might look at monthly TPOs. And uh, when I say TPO, I'm referring to market profile. When I say market profile, it's a TPO chart, right? So those are the same thing. Um, the most common use of this is going to be looking at it at a 
uh, a daily session for BTC. You'll see people break it down by individual trading sessions, you know, New York profile, Asian profile, London profile. Um, but the most common way to use this is based on a, a single trading day. If you're trading legacy, you might have a profile just for regular trading hours. Um, so cash session, for example. But again, not to get complicated. Uh, profile is old. So it's not some fancy tool. It's not sophisticated. It's a really old tool. Uh, it's around, I believe it's probably over 30 years old by now. It was developed during a time when volume wasn't reconciled to the end of the day. So you actually didn't have this volume profile that is on the right. This is the market profile on the left. That is the TPO chart. So TPO stands for time, price, opportunity. Okay, so I'm not going to get into auction market theory, but the idea is that time regulates all opportunities. And just think about it like this. If the market is able to spend a good amount of time in a region, right? let's say the market is moving lower and it's able to favor lower prices. Well, if it's valuable, right? If it's gotten away from value, if you're finding that you have an idea of where fair value is and suddenly something is dropped in value, it shouldn't be able to spend a lot of time there, right? So you know, one of the best things that I could, you know, one of the best examples I could give your analogies is like, let's say you had iPhones, right? Everyone knows what an iPhone costs. Like I buy a new iPhone every time a new iPhone comes out. It's a fucking poor habit of mine. Um, but an iPhone's like $1,200 now. Let's say you were told, okay, iPhones are going to drop tomorrow for, you know, or you just get some Intel or some Alpha that iPhones are going to drop to $400 tomorrow. I got 100 iPhones for sale for $400. How long do you think that those iPhones are going to be able to hang out at that level? Probably not long at all, right? If there was a profile for iPhones, right, and this is $1,200, that's fair value. The bottom of the profile at $400 would not look like this. And when I go into what the profile is, you'll understand what this that the, you'll understand what why this is. The bottom of the profile wouldn't be fat. The bottom of the profile, if it was an iPhone that was dropped in prices, would look something like that. Like there would be no time that those that that window of opportunity would be really small. So that's the idea. Time regulates all opportunities. It's, it's like when something's on sale, if people really value it, you're not going to find a lot of them on the shelves, right? That sale is going to be, you know, that sale is going to be done unless there's some kind of in infinite supply, but then the value would be different anyway. <clears throat> Either way, when this tool was developed, again, tool, not a strategy, not a system. Um, when this tool was developed, there was no reconciliation of volume throughout the day. There was no like tick by tick volume like we have today, which is, you know, crypto market is insane when it comes to the accessibility of data. Um, you know, it, things that in traditional markets, you'd have to have a much better feed for, or you'd have to pay for. Uh, but either way, back when profile was developed, there was no tick by tick volume. The volume wasn't figured out until the end of the day. So the idea that price spent a certain time in a region, like this region, for example, you know, in this profile, they spent most of the time here and very little time here. The idea of this area alone being where a ton of, you know, being where price spent the most time, that meant that there was a lot of volume traded there. Now we know better now. We know that there's actually cases where that's not even, you know, th these don't match, right? So you obviously want to see that price, um, that time, right? Where price spends time, you want to see that the TPO chart and the volume profile somewhat confirm each other. And you'll have cases, and again, I'm not going to get into any kind of weird anomalies or nuance in this video, but you'll have cases where, you know, this is kind of a, a somewhat of an example where price actually spends just a brief amount of time in a region, but there's a lot of volume done there. This is maybe not the best because there's actually two uh, columns there, but you'll have a case where there'll be like a tail in the profile, very thin. Meanwhile, the volume is like that in the really thin area, all right? But either way, when TPO was developed, that wasn't the case, right? You just thought, okay, price is spent almost all day between these two price points. Um, it must have been the case that we've done a lot of volume there, and you'd know exactly at the end of the day how much volume was done. So the TPO chart is on the left. The volume profile chart is on the right. Now, all of, all this tool is, is it, again, it looks wonky. It, it looks like Tetris, right? All, of, all this tool is, and I just want to zoom in a little bit, is a compression of the distribution of prices. So this profile right here is a really balanced profile. That profile probably looked like this. This is one of the many ways it could have looked like. 
spike up, very brief, came back in here, spent most of the time there, spike down, very brief, came back and spent most of the time there. If you were going to compress and like say you squash this profile from right to left, some came and squashed it, it's going to look like that, right? It's going to be thick in the middle, thin at the extremes. All that, That's the only thing that we're looking at. We're looking at a distribution of the price action for that day, where price spent the most amount of time. If you open up this structure, the way that it is normally sort of the generic um, setting for this, each individual column is a 30 minute period. So one of these columns is a 30 minute period. All right. Now it's compressed right now. So it's better to look at it on this chart over here. So that column is a 30 minute range of prices. Okay. The first column, 30 minute range of prices. The second, 30 minute range of prices. It doesn't say anything about how much time we spent at any individual point within there. All it says is that in 30 minutes, price moved from this point to this point. That was the high low. And then what we're doing is just taking those and squashing all of them to form a distribution. So the chart that is right here is a profile that is opened, okay? And if I was gonna draw that profile, let's say I wanted to draw that, I'll, I'll draw that on a uh, whiteboard. So just look at where the market spent most of the time there, very briefly there. Now this is a screenshot, but if you look back at this, I don't remember exactly what day this was. This was like last week, uh, and this was on, I think the 24th of um, August, it's local. Um, so that profile would probably look like this. Change the ink, let's, let's make this a black screen, obviously, so I don't have to change the ink. Profile would probably look, because remember, it looked like this, when it was opened, the profile would probably look like this. So thin area up here, higher volume region down there. And again, remember, it's not necessarily the volume, it's just where the bulk of the distribution occurred. So to reiterate, all we're doing is taking the underlying day and squashing it to show where we spent the most amount of time. Now, you're seeing a couple things from this, right? You're seeing the shape of the distribution. So this is a balanced day. Right? This day right here is very balanced. This day right here is very imbalanced. Right? This is more of an imbalanced day. This is more of a balanced day. Okay, We're seeing where price likes to spend the most amount of time. Now, you're going to gauge a lot of things from this when you begin to learn more about it. Right, You're going to see where value is developing over time, if it's consistently staying in one region versus others, if it's rejecting a certain area of the chart more frequently. For example, price was balanced right here. Okay, this is a very balanced profile. It's more range-like, rotation-like behavior. When price came up to the high the next day, you can see there's only one skinny little region on that TPO. It's like this little bar. And that means that we are only spent a brief amount of time up there. Very quickly, there is a selling tail, right? And there was a response by that side of the market above that prior day's high. Okay, so if it was the opposite, Right? If prices came up there and spent a lot of time, we might call that being accepted. But instead, price spent a very brief amount of time and was rejected. So that's all we're looking at. That's like the underlying idea. You're just seeing a distribution of prices where value is developing, right? Because you want to have some idea of fair value. And then from this, you might trade a certain way. You might trade you know, the value extremes. You might look to identify context a little bit more specifically, see where the sticky points are. There's a lot of different ways you could use this. And again, I'm not going specifically into any of those. The anatomy of the structure though, okay? So we have, we'll zoom in here, just to try to keep this, I promise to keep this as simple as possible and not get into any nuance. Here's the low of the day, okay? The high of the day. This red bar, that's my color. That's my setting. That is the POC. That is the point of control. Now, that is where we spent the most amount of time. That's going to be dependent on your tick setting, by the way. So if you have a large aggregation versus small, versus small aggregation, you're going to get a different feed, but you're going to get a different read on what, what specific price point or region that was. But that's where we spent the most amount of time for this distribution. That would be referred to as fair 
value. Now, there's a couple things, again, not to get into any kind of nuance or specifics. There's a couple things you might gauge from that. You might say, well, I don't want to do business or open up a position with any kind of directional certainty at that level because, I mean, that's the most agreed upon price. So fair value is the most agreed upon price or region. Okay. I got to work on my handwriting for these. No, I mean, see, I don't even have bad handwriting, right? Like I could, I could write this cleanly, but I'm just getting a little bit loose. Um, even that was not even necessarily that clean. So that is the POC. That is fair value. That is the most agreed upon price point for that day. Again, there's another POC that's next to that. That's in the volume point of control. That's in the, excuse me, the volume profile. And that's the VPOC. So the VPOC is what I just said. That is the volume point of control. Now that is actually where we did the most amount of volume for the day. You can see in this case, they both line up, right? So the, the volume confirms the price in this individual profile and the underlying volume profile for this TPO is actually the same distribution as well. Again, not to get into any kind of nuance, but there might be cases where here's actually a perfect example. This is referred to as excess. That's a selling tail. And meanwhile, you don't have excess in the volume point of control, but I'm breaking my rules, getting into things that beginners don't necessarily need to know. This region that's highlighted is known as the value area. That might be 68%. Or 70%, depending on my <laughs> truths. That was a that was a mistake. That might have been um, for the most part. It's it, you're going to find that generically it's going to be 70% on platforms. But I mean, it should be if you're getting technical about one standard deviation of a Gaussian distribution. It would be 68. I think 68.4 or 68.8. Right. So this would be 34. This would be 34. So one standard deviation, one standard deviation. And this would be the mean, right? That would be the point of control if you're looking at a Gaussian distribution. Um, but this is the value area for the day. So where price spent the most amount of time, where value is being established, right? When you have a range, a lot of times there's going to be a ton of overlap with value over the course of days, right? You might begin to show signs of, of a range forming if you have a trending day previously, and this day follows and you have value overlap between that trending day um, and this current day. Again, not to get into any kind of specifics. It's hard not to. Um, but this is where values are being established for the day, right? Trending day or the beginning of a trend, you're gonna see value migrate over a range of prices. It's not gonna be confined to any one, one given area. You know, buyers are either raising value higher or sellers are, are beginning to bring value lower, all right? the high bar that I have. Again, this is the value area high. This is the value area low. Mine is my own color setting. That's white dashed. You could set yours however you want. The low, that is excess at the low, right? So that is excess. This looks like if I had a, my tick setting is really low on this. This looks like just a regular high, right? So this is a good high. Now, in future videos, I'll get into poor highs and poor lows and the differences between, you know, uh, what makes a good low, what makes something with excess. We'll get into single prints. Um, more specifically, let's talk about the single prints right here because they are right here. This is re referred to as a high volume region, right? So think of this as a speed bump. If price is coming from above or below, it's probably going to find friction at this extreme, right? It's going to find either support or resistance at that level. Okay. Once we start accepting in, it's more common to see more range like behavior form again, not to get into any specifics, but that's a high volume region. So this is a HVN. Usually you're talking about HVNs. If you have like a profile over the course of an entire structure, this would be an HVN, right? This would be a, a low volume node. That would be a low volume node. In an individual profile, this is your low volume region. See how price barely spent any time here, right? Price was not really accepted within that level for long, did not spend much time there, didn't see much transacted there. Instead, we favored this prior point of control region, this prior range more before shifting value lower. But either way, this is a low volume region. 
This is an LVN, low volume node. This is an HVN. I'm thinking about volume and I'm saying that and then I'm forgetting to, to write the H and the L. Might be dyslexic, who knows? Sometimes I do that. Um, this right here is, is single prints, SP, single prints. Okay, that's just one column of TPOs. So there is no overlap. If you're looking at a 30 minute chart and you had 30 minute bars, this would be that high volume region. The single print might be just one 30 minute bar with no prior high or low interrupting it in that region before again, picking up with more activity below, which is down here, right? But again, just to keep this simple, because I feel like I'm already getting away into specifics I don't want to get into. This is just a distribution of price action, okay? Just a distribution. If I was going to draw what these would look like, because this is just a screenshot, a balanced day might occur multiple ways. It might look something like this. Let's say we opened up there. Okay. Might look something like this. Take the high, take the low, and then come right back within. Either way, when you compress those, it's going to look like this. Your trending days. So say price. profile is going to look more like this. Now there are things you could glean from structures like this that again, I'm not getting into in this video, these regions where there might be single prints, where there might be gaps, those low volume areas, a lot of times you could look to them potentially as support or resistance, depending on what direction we're traveling, where we're coming from. And you could begin to assess maybe how we would move if we were to accept back in within them as well. So if, like, let's say that this trending day, based out range down here and then started accepting back within this low volume region in the TPO chart. If we accept it into, let's say that that was, those were singles, that is kind of a gap. So you would probably move pretty quickly to the next sticky area, which would be the next HVN. Okay. This is just a distribution. That's, that's, that's all I want to reiterate. There's nothing complicated about it. It's just a distribution of price action throughout the day. You could set this up for, again, the weekly, the quarterly if you want. Um, but all we're seeing is where price is spending the most amount of time in the session. That's it. So in the beginning, I had that slide where I said, you know, where is the market? Where does the market like to spend the most amount of time? Where is the market doing the most business? Where is the market favoring? There's a bunch of different ways you could ask the same question. That's all we're seeing with this. Okay. So the areas where the market doesn't spend the most amount of time, Okay, we're seeing that it's rejected from that region, it falls back within this value area, and that's where it likes to spend time. That's where it might like to spend time in the future if we come back to that level. If we continue to stay within that level, we could trade that level like a range, right? It's a more bracketed, range-like, rotational um, sort of environment or set of conditions. Whoops. And that's that. Again, this was just a very entry-level video. I didn't want I don't want to get into any specifics uh, about how to trade with this. Um, I might have touched on a couple things that maybe I didn't intend on touching on, but all we're seeing again is not a Tetris chart. It's not, again, it's not a system. It's not a strategy. All it is is a tool. We're just squashing the day. And from that you get, you know, you have some kind of understanding of context, right? You get some kind of understanding of where are the sticky points, the sticky points. All right. Wait one sec. I'm going to master this. Are we balanced? Okay. Or are we imbalanced? Okay. Balanced. Okay. Imbalanced. The market is seeking is excuse me. The market is seeking balance between buyers and sellers. That's what we're doing. That touches more into auction market theory, which I don't intend on doing. But that's all we're looking at. It's not that complicated, is it? All right. So hopefully this was as introductory level as you can get. There's really uh, nothing special about this chart. It's not complicated at all. Again, just to reiterate, high 
low, value area low, value area high, POC, right? This thing on the right, these guys right here, that is the volume profile. Those have their individual POCs, which would be the VPOC. And that one's right there too. Lines up with the TPO POC. All right, but that's it. Where is the market spending the most amount of time? Where does it not like to spend time? All right, and, and if you're beginning to extend this a little bit more, you can start thinking of it as, all right, so if you have something that is in a range and it's balanced and you have structures like that, it's showing you that it favors this region. You would be looking then to look, you would be looking, excuse me, to either buy when value, when price gets far away from value to the downside or sell when price gets far away from value to the upside. A sign of change would be like, let's say that these are iPhones. Why is this not picking up sometimes? Hold on. Imagine that these are iPhones, right? Here's the fair value for iPhones. This is where price has been spending the most time. Let's say suddenly, you know, we have prices dropping down to 800 and there's a bunch of iPhones for sale and they're not, they're not selling. So you have a TPO chart that begins to accumulate down there. Whereas previously it really didn't spend, it couldn't spend any time down there at all. Right? So buyers are not as aggressive at bidding this up. So again, time regulates all opportunities. If that's such a good opportunity, why are we able to spend so much time at those prices? And you can begin to, again, think of it that way, right? If Bitcoin is so valuable, right, at $20,000, then why when we come down to $18,000, aren't people all over that, right? The moment that we start hanging out at prices, that's when you could begin to say that those prices are being accepted by the market. All right, so that was, again, introductory. Hope you guys have a fantastic evening and I look forward to putting out more content.